What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, we've got a whole lot of really fun stuff to talk about today. Uh, as the title shows, it's all about frame rates today. Um, you know, everything from 24 frames per second all the way up to, you know, the 180, 240 frames per second, like what you can find on things like the GH5S. Um, and we, we're basically just going to be talking about, you know, kind of when and why you should be looking at using certain different frame rates. You know, why in some areas it's better to use, say, 60 frames per second as your actual output instead of using it for slow motion. Um, I've got a couple of quick videos that I've shot over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, just kind of showing some of the slow motion sides, like what you can gain out of these different modes. We're going to be taking a look at my S1H here. Uh, to actually go over and show you in the cameras how you can actually get to a lot of these different frame rates. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the differences between standard frame rates, so things like 24, tw uh, 24 30, 60 frames, but then also uh, how with the Lumix cameras we employ what's called HFR, so high frame rate, uh, which in the S1H if you look is something like 120 frames per second. Uh, versus things like what you have in variable frame rate, which is going to record in an overcrank or an undercranked uh, method, but outputs in a more standardized frame rate. So we're going to be looking and talking a whole lot about this. Um, one of the uh, biggest things about uh, Lumix Live, this platform that we have, is interaction with all of you, with the community. Uh, this is a platform that is designed for all of you to be able to communicate directly with us here at Panasonic. Uh, in the, the Lumix division, uh, to be able to get your questions answered. Uh, so if you have questions during this broadcast, make sure to drop them in the chat, tag uh, at Lumix cameras, so type the at symbol, start typing Lumix, and you'll see Lumix cameras pop up. Uh, and what that will do is it'll prompt on my side so I can actually see the question uh, and be able to get you guys, hopefully get you guys an answer. Uh, as much as I know about pretty much everything in our cameras, there are some times that I, I can get tripped up, but when things like that happen, we will be able to at least bring that back to my team, some of the others that I work with, you know, Matt Frazier, people like that, and try to get you guys an answer. So, um, before we go any further, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. We have Lumix Pro Services available here in the United States and in many other countries as well. Uh, in the United States, uh, we have two levels of membership. You have the red and the platinum tier. The red is a free level membership for you to be able to get protection on your equipment. Uh, the red tier provides the extended three-year manufacturer warranty. So should something go wrong with the camera from a manufacturing perspective, uh, you've got yourself covered for three years. Uh, when you uh, also get yourself registered on this, it gets you in so that you'll always be up to date on new cameras, new lenses, new products, firmware updates, all that kind of fun stuff uh, so that you can always stay up, you know, current with what's going on with Panasonic Lumix. If you're someone who uses your equipment in a much uh, you know, harder way, or you just like having a better peace of mind about the support behind your equipment, we offer the Platinum Series, which is a paid service. Uh, the Platinum Series offers you that three-year extended manufacturer warranty, but then also adds in a whole bunch of extra goodies for anyone that's you know, kind of really wanting to make sure that your camera is in tip-top shape as you move through its lifetime. You get two-day repairs with free next-day shipping both ways, 20% off out-of-warranty repairs. So if you drop your camera and you break something, uh, that would be an out-of-warranty repair, and you can get 20% off that if you're in the Platinum Series. You also get an exclusive membership hotline where if you need to speak to somebody, you're able to actually contact uh, by phone and actually speak to someone here on the Lumix team. Uh, aside from that, you get annual sensor cleanings and lens calibrations and all the kind of fun, normal stuff that you'd expect to have uh, in a tier like this uh, to make sure your equipment is good, say, at the end of your wedding season or event season. Uh, outside of that, uh, the last thing you get with that, um, well, not really the last thing, one of the other cool things you get with that is a welcome gift, which uh, has a really cool Peak Design strap in there. Uh, so if you're someone who's really looking forward to getting into, you know, kind of some solid support, uh, you can check out the QR code that was on the screen there uh, or the links down in the video description uh, so that you can get yourself registered and see what's available in your region. Uh, outside of the United States, there is the global portal for uh, Lumix Pro Services, which we have a link again down in the description for that. 
Uh, that will let you know which, which countries have uh, the LPS programs up and running, and then you can take a look at what levels each individual region offers. Um, yeah, so let's see here. Um, let's see, I covered how to ask us a question. Um, covered LPS. Um, if you don't already, make sure to head over to the Instagram account for Lumix Cameras or Lumix USA. Uh, give us a follow. We've got some cool stuff going on over there, and you can always continue the conversation with us by uh, dropping us a message in our direct messages, uh, and we try to get to those as fast as we can. Um, if for some reason you may not be able to get an answer done on this stream or you've got a recommendation. Um, speaking of recommendations, if you have recommendations for future streams or topics that you want to have us cover, uh, you can either drop those down in the chat uh, or you can email us at lumixlive at us.panasonic.com. Uh, I check that email pretty much every day. Don't always respond from it, but um, this way you can get your voice heard uh, by us for topics that you want to have us cover. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers up the, uh, yeah, that pretty much covers up the whole intro spiel that I normally do. Uh, so let's see here. Um, let's go through some of the questions that look like they've already come in. Uh, thanks for doing these programs. This is from Lee. Thanks for doing these programs. Uh, I've been shooting a documentary in 24 frames per second, uh, but we broadcast on public TV, which is requiring 30 frames per second. Is that a problem? And how does that affect the quality? Um, so there's a couple things that you could potentially run into. Um, for one, 24 frames per second, you're only capturing 24 frames per second. Uh, displaying it in 30, uh, you could have some issues with uh, just in general skippiness. Uh, and in some, some broadcast situations, they just won't accept it because it may not play right. Um, one of the things that, you know, we, the goal of what I wanted to talk about today is that kind of knowing what the project is that you're shooting for and how to actually capture for that project. Um, we get so caught up, at least here in the United States, uh, about using 24 frames per second for everything. And um, that can cause you some issues down the line, especially when the fact that you look at 24 frames per second, there's really kind of two types of 24. There's true 24 frames per second, which is 24.00. And then there's 24 kind of more commonly, so 23.97 or 9.8. Um, and between at least those two, not a huge major difference, um, but 24 to 30 frames per second, you could run into things like some audio issues. Uh, as the clip gets longer and longer, your audio sync is not maybe not going to really match up the way it should. Um, and in most cases, there are software solutions that you can try to maybe, you know, kind of help build that image up or that 24 frame into a 30 frames per second. Um, but ultimately, one way to just really test if it's going to work fine is take your 24p project uh, that you have, export it in 30 frames and watch it. Uh, watch it on a display, on a TV, computer, phone, where, wherever you think it's actually going to be output and viewed uh, and, and do a, you know, kind of visual check of it. Um, when you do things like that, you may catch stuff that you didn't really recognize up front. Uh, you may notice audio start to, you know, desync, things like that. So uh, image quality wise, not going to really see a difference there. Um, probably the biggest thing that you're going to see is that uh, image quality between 24 and 30 frames per second is really going to come down more to motion cadence. Uh, 24p, you really got to be careful with panning. Um, there's a whole discipline about panning in 24 frames per second. 30 frame makes it a little bit easier. Um, so you don't get kind of skippy looking footage as you pan. Uh, and really, you just kind of have to look at the project and see what, what the requirements are. Um, that being said, in some cases, because I'm not a broadcaster, in some cases, 24p might be perfectly fine with the, the uh, broadcast studio that you're sending it to. Um, work closely with your client uh, in, in situations like that. Make sure that uh, you know, you've got all the information you need for capture. And if for some reason it's not exactly what they need, work with them and they probably have a, a resolution that they can uh, help you with. Um, let's see here. 
Uh, Lumix cameras. So about frame rates, is it a bad idea to film at 60p for best AFC performance and then convert it to 30p? I presume dropping into a 24p timeline would cause a lot of artifacting. So, um, this is a conversation that Matt Frazier and I have a lot, actually. Um, so there are a ton of software programs out there and plugins for things like Premiere and, and whatever editing software you're using that can allow you to shoot at much higher frame rates uh, and keep things like the 180 degree shutter rule uh, to, to keep your motion cadence looking proper per frame and then use software to reinterpret that footage at lower frame rates. Um, basically, where it'll either throw out, uh, throw out frame rates, things like that. And it, it, can be, um, it can be very beneficial. It will add a little bit of time into your post workflow and particularly to your point, shooting in things like 60 frames per second, um, you know, 120 frames per second on the S1H, uh, things like that, the more data that the camera's capturing, the better the performance can be. Uh, you kind of just have to look at it, um, you know, on your side. Uh, converting from 60 frames to 24 frames per second, um, I don't really think you're going to run into any kind of major noticeable... Uh, artifacting or issues as long as it's done right. Uh, if you look at a number of filmmakers, especially, I, I, I would say, especially in the, the video, uh, or the wedding video filmmakers, um, shooting 60 frames per second to get your slow motion footage in 24 um, is fairly common because up until recently, the frame rates for a 24p output was basically limited to 60 frames. And in pretty much most of the cameras out there, that's, that is what you're limited to. You have to shoot 60p, output in 24, and basically just make sure that the software is doing the uh, conversion correctly. Um, when it comes to the Lumix cameras, though, if you're particularly looking to do something where, you know, 24p is your output and you want to be able to output in 24p, but then also slow footage down at like a 50% speed, that's where features like what we have in the S1H, being able to shoot 48 frame per second, uh, really will come in handy because that's a straight two to one or uh, two times slowdown. There's not really any major work that the uh, software has to do to interpret footage or skip frames or things like that. It literally just tosses half the frames and you have a 24p piece of footage. Um, this also makes your audio sync pretty easy uh, when you're setting stuff up like that. So I have my S1H attached here and let me make sure I got everything set up. So, you know, we're looking at my, my S1H right now. And if I go in for those that are interested in this, uh, if you go in right into the menus, you'll see that under rec quality, aside from things like, you know, 6k 24p, which as you can see here is 23.98. Uh, you can always, at least on this camera and a lot of the newer ones, you can click the display button, go to frame rates, and then pick this 47.95. Uh, 47.95, when I come back out here, you'll see I can take the options to do Cinema 4K at 48p. I can do 4K at 48p, 1080 at 48p, or I can even do 4K anamorphic at 48 frames per second. Now, on, a, on an S1H, it's going to be a cropped sensor, so it's going to be using the Super 35 region uh, to capture that, uh, because what this does is this gives the camera the much higher uh, frame rate output, uh, because it's not going to be scanning the entire full height of the sensor. It's using the Super 35 region. Uh, and that's an example of the HFR functionality that we have in the camera, so high frame rate functionality. Um, most cameras that can shoot really high frame rates, you're usually kind of giving up a couple of things. You might be giving up either autofocus or you might be giving up audio depending on how high you go. Uh, and most cameras, that when you hit over, say, 120 frames per second, uh, you basically, it's either single point AF or you have no autofocus. Um, and this can be seen in, in even our cameras when you use variable frame rate. So... Um, yeah, so looking at as far as like the conversions go when you're looking at what your output's going to be, if you know that you're going to be working in a 24p timeline uh, and you have an S1H or a camera that can record at 48 frames per second, 
shoot in 48 frame and then just output in 24p. It can basically help you um, speed up a lot of your output. Um, and that actually leads me to a poll that I want to drop uh, in the chat here. Um, basically about 48 frame per second. Do you, do you see yourself um, using something like 48 frames per second uh, if it was included in a camera for, say, like a 24p uh, timeline? Uh, so do you see yourself using 48p HFR if it was available? All right. So we will drop that down in the chat. Cool. So that pulls up. Let me know what you what you think. If you're someone that works in 24 frames per second, is having an actual HFR native 48 frame per second something that is beneficial to you? Uh, let me know in the chat, in the uh, the poll in the chat. Uh, so let's see here. Okay. The other side benefit of using something like HFR in our cameras is that you maintain autofocus and you maintain audio. So we go back to like Lee's uh, question, you know, about the different frame rates and what I was mentioning about the potential of having issues with audio desyncing. When you're shooting something in 48 frames and you're capturing audio for that 48 frames, when you bring that into say post into you know, Premiere or Final Cut or Resolve or whatever you're working in, and you're working on a 24p timeline, your audio sync isn't going to be as big of an issue. Um, you know, ridiculously long clips, yeah, sure, maybe you may run into a slight desync near the end of the clip, uh, but everything's going to be so much closer uh, into the actual way that it should be recorded. Um, so that's a benefit of HFR. And with the S1H, you've got 48 frame per second HFR, and you also have 120 frames per second HFR for things like uh, 1080p. So you've got a ton of different frame rates, depending on say how slow you wanna have the content go, um, where you may be outputting uh, the, the footage. Uh, most places aren't gonna natively support 48 frames. In fact, 48 frame is not an HDMI specification frame rate, so it won't work. It's gonna come out as 24p. Um, but 120 frames per second, as we start to evolve HDMI specifications and cameras start to get better and better, as you guys have seen, you know, devices like the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus can support up to 4K 120, um, which means that in things like that, you can have an actual native 120 frames per second out. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's see here. Let's go through a couple more of the questions that have come in here. Um, okay, Sha says, will there be a firmware update for the G95 with some enhancements? It seems the camera was not improved for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any information about the G95 or G90 in some regions uh, for firmware updates. But um, if you follow us, if you get subscribed, if you uh, get into our email lists, that's where you would know first uh, pretty much over everything. Um, let's see here. Um, all right. Mark says, what about 24p for YouTube? Okay, so this, this is probably going to be a very controversial take uh, among filmmakers versus YouTubers. Um, I definitely, so for full disclosure, I would consider myself these days more of a YouTuber than a filmmaker. Um, I know enough on the filmmaking side that I can, I can make it work. Uh, but I know a lot more about streaming and the frame rates involved in that side of this, uh, you know, kind of videography. Uh, when it comes to 24 frames per second on YouTube, um, it's all going to depend on the content that you're producing. Uh, YouTube can show 24 frames per second. Not a problem. It shows 24, 30p, uh, 60 frames. You have those options and it'll display it in the frame rate that you upload it. Um, where most people get, I think, make a mistake in this kind of area is not necessarily picking the right frame rate for the content that you're trying to share or show. So I've talked about this before in previous uh, broadcasts, but for our live streaming and for our training videos that I create, um, we shoot at 60 frames per second. 
And there's a number of reasons for that. And we shoot at 60 frames per second to be delivered in 60 frame. Um, while it may not to some people look filmic or have the, um, you know, kind of cinematic feel and it looks very video. Um, a lot of that just comes down to the sharpness of the footage. 60p or 50p footage, if you're um, working in PAL, is going to be sharper footage, just inherently. Less motion blur, even when you're following the 180 degree uh, shutter angle rule uh, or guideline these days, um, it will be a lot sharper. Uh, and in certain, in certain cases, like things like this, where I'm jumping back and forth between, say, a camera angle and then back to my face, uh, if I have a website up that's going to have graphics that I want to show people, um, shooting and displaying in 60 frames per second has the added benefit that it's much clearer for people to read and see. So if you're someone doing educational work where you're going to be either working through menus or say I had a top-down camera and I wanted to show the physical buttons on the S1H, uh, in a case like that, I'm still going to shoot it in 60 frames because I don't need that piece of footage to be cinematic looking. It doesn't add anything to the actual production that you're doing. So outside of that, if you're putting up, say, an art piece or it's a short film or, you know, a wedding, of course, load it up, put it in the frame rate that, that you want to have it output in. And YouTube and Vimeo and, you know, even Facebook and all these different platforms that you may want to load videos to, um, they'll all support the traditional frame rates. It's when you start to get to the higher frame rates that um, 60p is pretty much the limit that most of them support. Uh, some locations are now supporting higher frame rate. Um, like I believe I read an article about... YouTube supporting 120 frames per second for a little while, but it's really intensive and most output doesn't view it in 120 frame. So you just kind of look at, at what your content is uh, and you honestly really just don't have to worry too much about it when you're, you're loading it into something like YouTube. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit, Mark. Um, let's see here. Um... Whoop, thank you, YouTube, for jumping the uh, chat. Okay, there it goes. Uh, William says, noticed with the faster the frame rate, the more accurate AF is. Uh, granted, I try to use manual focus as much as possible, but I found that when I need AF, the faster frame rates provide better results. Um, and yeah, with, with our cameras, um, with our system, if you shoot at 60 frames per second, the focus is probably going to be more accurate. It's going to be a little bit faster. Um, the DFD system, the more information you can provide it per, per frame, the faster the system's going to work. So one of my biggest recommendations, uh, like we were saying earlier, is if you're someone who outputs in 24 frames per second, shoot in 48 frame if you've got an S1H and it has that recording option. Not every camera has 48 frames, so it's not really like a blanket, hey, always shoot in 48. Um, but yeah, shoot in 48 frame and then just export it out as 24p. You're going to get the benefit of more data being provided to the focusing system for it to process and work its AF, uh, and it'll output still in 24, you know, really nicely. Um, when you go to things like 60p or you go into Super 35, yeah, that also speeds up the system because it's sampling at faster rates. Um, the more information you can feed uh, the system, the faster and more accurate it will be. Uh, and that's for pretty much the G series or the S series cameras. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Walkabout, uh, do you have any ETA on Lumix Pro in Australia? Unfortunately, I don't. You would have to check with uh, Panasonic or Lumix Australia. Um, I know that they, they are fairly active um, when it comes to social. I know a couple of the, the team members over there. Um, so I can check for you. And uh, maybe if you join us next week, I might be able to have an answer for you. Uh, to get you some, you know, kind of at least some sort of an update. Um, I know that uh, LPS programs have been rolling out and enhancing and kind of uh, we've, we've been working to refine the whole process uh, globally since it is a globally supported program. So if you buy a camera and have LPS in the U.S. and say you go to the U.K. and you have a problem, LPS is going to help you cover uh, if you're, say, on travel uh, when we can get back to normal travel <laughs> um, to make sure that everything's, you know, kind of safe and secure with your uh, setup. Uh, so let's see here. 
lots of questions about that AF. Uh, so, um, okay, it's another one. I think I've answered that a, a couple of times already. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jenny says, off topic, how often do you recommend cleaning the sensor of a G9? Uh, please. Um, truthfully, I clean my sensors probably once a month um, myself. Uh, but I've worked in the photo industry uh, between working photo retail and actually running sensor cleanings and things like that for the company I used to work for um, as a not like a formalized tech, but doing sensor cleanings. Uh, and I'm comfortable enough with doing it to my own cameras. Um, plus I have the benefit that I work for the company, so it's fairly easy for me to do it. Um, as far as your own cameras go, um, know that sensor cleaning is always a, uh, you know, at your discretion thing. Um, if you damage the sensor while doing it with water or, uh, the cleaning fluid getting into the camera, um, know that that's not something that's covered under warranty. Um, because that's not a manufacturer defect. So you do want to be a little careful with it. Um, typically the main thing I recommend, uh, if you do notice spots or you want to make sure that you're trying to keep up on your camera is to get one of those. And I don't think I have one here. Uh, just get one of those little like kind of hand pump air blowers to blow out dust, uh, loose dust that would be on the sensor. Um, that can happen from changing lenses or just working in different environments. Um, since the, at, at least in the S and the G series cameras, if you're using lenses that are, um, uh, weather resistant, uh, you're going to have a seal there. So you shouldn't really have to worry too much about dust at all. Uh, it's always going to be when you're taking the lens off that you could potentially introduce it. It's the same in, D in the DSLR era. Um, but yeah, I do mine about once a month, but that's because I'm neurotic with it. Uh, easiest thing to do is if you, if you, are getting ready to go out to shoot, um, just take a photo of a uh, kind of like blank wall, uh, focus to infinity, stop the lens down as much as you can, uh, take a quick shot of a kind of blank wall uh, that you know doesn't have any kind of marks on it, and you'll be able to see if there's dust on the sensor. Uh, if you see it that way, it's usually down in the sensor, and then just get one of those little air blowers and uh, blow it out. Do not ever, 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 ever use canned air to blow dust out of a sensor. Um, that is a recipe for destroying your camera. Um, even if it works nine times in a row, that 10th time you could get some of the propellant that sprays out and just destroys the cover glass. So do not ever do that. Um, it is not a great thing to do. Um, let's see here. We'll go through here. Uh, Jake, uh, I have an S5, but notice that the S1H has a VFR option. Can you please explain what it is and why that would be useful? Yes. So the S1H, like we see here, I have my S1H attached, has a mode that's called variable frame rate. So VFR. Uh, and you can see it here in, in the cameras that you can select the menu option, uh, actually filter your, your options. It's just easier to demonstrate it on this. Uh, other cameras, it'll be a menu option that you select. But so when I go into VFR and then I turn this on and I push my display button to come back, you'll see that on the S1H, it drops down to 8-bit codecs. Um, what variable frame rate is, is it's going to output a, say, 24, 30, or a 60 frames per second uh, file. That is the frame rate of the file that you're going to get. But what it allows you to do is go in and what's called overcrank or undercrank the sensor. So that means that I can shoot it, say, 120 frames per second on a 24p output and get, I believe that's a four times slow motion. Uh, and the way this works is it's recording 120 frames per second, but it's storing them slowed down already in 24p uh, or 2398 in this case. Um, it's a really, really quick way to get slow motion footage right out of the camera without the need to go into software to actually then do your slowdown uh, in post. And I've got a couple examples of different frame rates and what you can do with them, uh, excuse me, in a moment. Um, the difference between the S1H and an S5 is that the S5 has what's called slow and quick mode. Um, it's very, very similar uh, function. They're both a 4208 bit. Um, they're both going to be long GOP. 
and they're both going to say what is your output frame rate that you're looking for so 24 30 or 60 and then in slow and quick you have different uh frame rates that are just selectable they're statically selectable uh the s1h the gh5 gh5s they have the full-blown variable frame rate functionality which is similar to like what our vera cams do and some of the higher end cinema cameras um, that lets you pick more increments uh, between each one. Uh, and then on the other side of it, you can undercrank the sensor. So output at 24 frames per second footage that may only capture two frames per second. So it's a really quick, easy way to do things like, uh, you know, time-lapse or hyperlapse videos by using HFR or in the S5 using slow and quick. You just go to the quick side. Um, that's really the main difference between them. Uh, variable frame rate, high speed shooting, uh, if you're on an S1 or an S1R, or slow and quick in the S5, they're pretty much the same thing with just a couple of different uh, customization options between each camera. Uh, and a lot of it just comes down to, if you're in an S1H and you need high speed filming like that, you're probably gonna have a lot higher needs for certain things. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the main difference. So hopefully that um, that answered your question about the uh, the frame rates. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what is the proper operating voltage for the G9 and GH5S, 7.2 or 7.4, et cetera, for external battery? Um, DH, uh, if you look up the, uh, for the G9 and the GH5S is going to be the DCC12, I believe. And the AC9 or uh, AC10 adapter, like AC adapter, uh, that is the voltage and uh, throughput that's required uh, for a uh, dummy battery uh, to operate the camera. Um, you don't want to be using third party. Um, I, I can only say this enough, but third party, you run the risk of not having the proper voltage get sent to the camera. Um, you don't know how they're manufactured. You don't know what the uh, components are that they use, the quality of the components. You could damage your camera with a third-party power solution. Um, so I, I'm a big stickler on this. I never recommend third-party power solutions like dummy batteries. Um, the newer modern cameras that have USB charging, uh, that's a little bit of a different story because those are standards. Uh, USB PD is a standardized power delivery spec. Uh, so companies that actually stick to it, um, like I have one right here on the side, it's a little 10,000 milliamp hour USB battery bank that is USB PD spec. Means that when I plug it into my S1H or my S5, I know that the spec and power that's being delivered is the proper spec and power. Um, but yeah, so DH, look up the, uh, I believe it's a DCC-12 and an AC-10 uh, AC adapter. That should give you the information you need. Uh, Dennis, uh, hey, do you know if there is a specific setting to enable for 10-bit HDMI output? I tried recording external ProRes via my Blackmagic Video Assist 12G for a client, uh, but had lots of 8-bit banding artifacts. Uh, which camera are you using, Dennis? Um... With the, a lot of the S cameras, and a lot of the newer cameras, uh, you don't have to specify the output for 10-bit. Um, when you put the cable in and you put it into the, the device, as long as you've got a 10-bit codec selected in camera, um, it's going to output 10-bit. Uh, if you've got an 8-bit uh, file selected, like on an original GH5, if you wanted 10-bit output, you had to actually go to the menu to say, I want 10-bit output. Um, the newer cameras, you don't really have to do that. So yeah. Um, if you let me know, uh, Dennis, what the, which camera you're using, I might be able to help a little bit more. Um, all right, let's see here. Uh, and uh, as, uh, Ulrich points out, you know, with Europe using 25 and 50 P everything that I'm talking about with, you know, the, the different frame rates, there's always going to be actually 90% of the time there's a PAL comparative to it so when i say 120 frames per second that would be equal to say like 100 frame per second when you have the camera switched over to pal so the pull downs are going to be the same the one that doesn't exist to my knowledge is 48 frame 
uh, but you would be using 50 frame to output it 25 anyway. So it would be pretty much the same. Actually, it is the same thing. Um, so let's see here. Um, let me uh, bring up some of these clips. So, you know, when we talk about frame rates, one of the most common things that people do with high speed filming. So we're just going to focus on high speed right now. Uh, when most people think of high speed filming, they think of the purpose of doing slow motion. And there's a lot of things that you actually have to consider when you want to shoot slow motion, depending on the output that you're trying to put it into. So say if you want to do things like the videos I'm going to show in a second, which is a match being lit uh, by a flame. So flame is already running, taking a match, putting it in, watching the flame, you know, kind of ignite. Normally, when it comes to frame rates and shutter angle, a lot of times you'll find a lot of different opinions as to, well, what shutter angle should you use? If you're shooting at 120 frames per second, do you shoot at 180th of a 180 degree shutter angle, which would be 240th of a second shutter speed? Um, you know, how do you make that decision? And it goes back to that, that output. You know, what is it you're trying to show? In the clips that I'm gonna show here, which we've got here, this is a number of different clips. So these are the these first two are 24 frames per second, but you'll notice that it has real choppy uh, kind of staccato looking footage. And then now we're going into different levels of slow motion uh, into that. What you end up running into is if you're trying to show something and you want to have really good fine detail of every frame, you're going to want to shoot that piece of footage in staccato, so a faster shutter speed. In my case, with these particular clips, we're shooting at a 45 degree shutter angle. So we're doing it pretty quick, um, trying to be, uh, you know, each individual frame is going to be capturing as much footage as it possibly can, and it needs to be doing it very quickly. So what that gets you in the end result is something that has a lot of sharpness, a lot of detail to it, because I'm. that's what the goal is for this. Um, you know, as you watch right here, at a 45 degree shutter angle, while this match is being lit, you get to really see every little piece of detail as to how that flame is propagating through the, the um, match itself, versus when you start looking at the 24p, it's real quick. Um, you know, matches light, very fast when you're doing it this way and varying different frame rates are going to give you different slowdown effects so all of these are output at 24 frame this one is uh you're seeing uh 240 frames per second being slowed down into 24 frame so that you get that really slowed piece of footage and then as we continue going on, you know, that's where you look at the difference between do you want HFR, do you want variable frame rate to look at the different speeds that you can get. Um, variable frame rate in most cameras that we have is where you're going to get your, your slowest slowdown footage, where the other, um, the high frame rate modes are going to be more of the standard. So you kind of have a little bit of different effects that you can get out of each of these as you kind of pick which one works best for your shooting. Um, so why shoot with, with shooting at these high frame rates, what's the benefit of shooting at a normal, um, you know, kind of shutter angle? Well, that's going to let you do things like have a little bit better motion cadence. If you're trying to fit it into a 24 P timeline, you don't want it to look so quote unquote video. You want it to look more, you know, kind of filmic. Um, you want to make sure that you're picking the right shutter speed so that it, you know, kind of makes the best sense for, the output that you're going with the motion cadence. Um, let's see here. A couple of the other uh, questions came here. Um, Nick says, it seems to me 60p gives the most flexibility with what to do with the footage afterwards in terms of rendering it 23, 24, 30, etc. Yeah, it's the most commonly used one right now. Um, up until really the S1H, most uh, DSLMs or uh, mirrorless cameras, they're not really called DSLMs anymore, uh, mirrorless cameras and DSLRs would shoot at normal frame rates. And when you wanted to do slow down, you had to do 60p or 59.97 um, or 59.94 to then bring it down into 24p. And you'd always have some, you know, if you're someone who's hawkish on 
uh, artifacts and stuff, you could get some artifacts maybe. Uh, but cameras like the S1H, they kind of changed it. Uh, 24p gives you a true, you know, doubling of the frame rate so that you've got an actual half speed ready to go in camera. And again, with the S1H, you've got audio and focus with it, and it's pushing more data through the sensor, so you're going to get better focusing than you get at 24 frames per second as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely 60 is, up until recently, one of the most flexible frame rates to shoot at because you can output at 60, depending on the platform, uh, but you do also have all those other frame rates. The thing you want to keep in mind with it when you're shooting in 60 is the motion cadence. That's where software, um, I think one is called Twixter. Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look that up. Um, but there are plugins that you can get that will match motion cadence properly for you. It, you're going to spend more time in post, but it gives you more flexibility with what you want to do with that piece of footage afterwards. Uh, Alan says, I could see myself using 960p for special situations. Yeah, uh, you, you know, anything over, like, say, 240 frames per second, you start getting into where it's like, are you using it for more scientific applications uh, or special effects than necessarily cinematic work? Because 960 frames per second, even 240 frames per second, as you saw in some of those clips with the match, it's ridiculously slow. Um, so, yeah, the, the faster the frame rates get, the slower and slower the output becomes when you're working in 24 uh, and again, that goes back to the storytelling that you're, you're giving. Um, in some cases that high of a frame rate actually makes no sense. Um, because you're, you know, a one second clip now becomes a, you know, 30 second clip or a, you know, minute and a half clip. Um, I'm a big fan of watching things like the slow-mo guys. And I love when they put up a, the slow-mo clip, uh, they did one of like glass breaking and watching the crack, crack propagate. And that clip itself was only a couple of seconds long, but then they actually uploaded the full, you know, full slow-mo piece up there on YouTube, and it was like nine hours long. So yeah, you have to just watch, uh, you know, how, what you're going to be doing with it. So uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Um, I've had a G9 for two years. Photos, seems photos from back then are sharper sometimes. Not sure I'm following. Oh, for the sensor cleaning. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, Jetty, it would be, um, uh, if, if you notice that, like, things may not seem to be as sharp, uh, as they would have been before, um, sensor cleaning can be something to take a look at. Um, usually, if you use something like, I love using these little, like the little Aperture MCs, um, because they're stupid bright. Um, well, I have the brightness turned down on this one, but uh, they're super bright, and I, when you hold the camera with the lens off, you can kind of shine it and reflect uh, through the sensor and the cover glass um, to see where there's dust. Uh, using a quick, you know, kind of air blower, like the hand pump ones that I was saying, that can usually cause a really big change uh, if there's a lot of dust on the sensor. Um, but if something like that doesn't work, then you want to start looking at wet cleaning, uh, which is a sk relatively a skill on its own. Um, so you have to, you have to kind of judge, um, the best way to tell if you need it or not, or if it's something that's going to be beneficial for you is to, you know, take the lens off, look at the sensor, see if you can see visible dust. If you can, then yes, it's definitely impacting your image quality. Uh, the other thing to look at is making sure the rear element of your lens is clean. Um, it's an often overlooked part of the image pipeline. A lot of people will always make sure the front of the element's clean. Um, but say if you take a lens off and then you're not paying attention and you happen to like just barely touch the rear element with the finger or you, know, you put it in the bag that one time without a rear cap on it because you're in a rush, we all do it. Um, you know, you can cause uh, bad image quality um, through things like that. So, yeah, um, hopefully that helps, um, Jetty. Uh, let's see here. Back in. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Uh, 
Oh, are you updating the BGH1 firmware? Uh, okay, it looks like a little bit of a side conversation. Um, okay, that's talking about that stuff. Uh, William, would love to see 48P as a firmware update to the S5 if the image processor supports it. Um, we've asked uh, a lot of that stuff. You know, is 48 frames something that the other cameras can get? Uh, something to know is that you know, the higher the frame rate you shoot, the more heat is generated by the processor and the sensor. Um, so cameras have to be designed to actually properly record in those frame rates. Um, as it is already, if you look at the S5 versus an S1H, um, you know, the S1H is actively cooled. It's got a, you know, a fan that cools it that still maintains weather resistance. Uh, and that's a camera that can do unlimited recording in all of the modes. The S5, which doesn't have active cooling and uses chassis cooling, um, you do have time limits on recording because of the thermal load that gets built up. And thermal load isn't necessarily just because the camera gets hot or a component gets hot. Hotter sensors produce noisier images. So there's always a balance between even if a processor could do it, um, is the image that's going to come out of it as you're shooting that is it going to still be the image that you're expecting out of it? Um, so it's always a little bit of a balancing act. But we, uh, Matt and I have asked about 48 frame in future firmware updates if it's possible. Um, I just don't have an answer one way or another if it is possible or not for you right now. So uh, let's see here. Jonathan says, who even says no to 48p, lol, almost 36%. You know, and, and to be fair, there are a ton of users out there that would never use 48 frame. Um, you know, to the point, like I was saying before, the vast majority of the content that I produce and I deliver is actually shot and, excuse me, shot and delivered in 60p. There's not really a need for me to shoot in 48 frame. Um, if I want to slow down, you know, a 60p piece of footage, I'll shoot 120 frame, which the S1H does for me. So, um, but to your point, you know, there's seeing that, you know, Two thirds of the uh, of the people that have voted can see yourself using 48 frame. You know, it's it's definitely a a really cool, awesome thing that the S1H has. So uh, let's see here. Um, let's see here. Uh, where was I? Question wise. Uh, there it goes. William says this is the way. Yes, this is the way. Uh, super zero, super zero, uh, on the GH5 Mark II in the focus menu, one area AF moving speed. How does that differ from the speed in the custom AF settings? Um, one area AF moving speed is literally just how fast the focus box moves when you're using the cursor. It has no impact on speed of the focus. It's just, if you're using the cursor and you want to go from the left to the right up down, it's just how fast that box moves. Um, pretty simple little feature that's in there um let's see here blackbird says which mode on the s1h is better for slow motion 120 10 bit with audio mode or the 120 vfr mode this is a great question so when you look at your output how are you going to be using the footage uh, if you are going to be shooting in log and you want to be editing this footage and mixing it in with some other properties that you might be shooting, say if, if your end goal is a 24p output, right? HFR will be the better way to shoot. Uh, HFR, it's a uh, actually native faster frame rate. So it is 120 frames per second. Um, it's also in a 10-bit it's a 10-bit codec, so you're going to have more flexibility to actually edit it in post, um, where the 120 frames per second VFR is an 8-bit codec. So if you're, you really wouldn't want to shoot 8-bit codecs in V-Log or V-Log-L, depending on what camera you're working with. Um, I'm sure some of the other users in the chat that shoot high speed would tell you probably the same thing. But when you use VFR it can 100% work for you if you're just shooting in say like, like 709 or natural profile and you're not gonna bring it into an editing software. You don't need to really do anything pushing colors or anything. Um, that's where VFR can really be a good quick way to get yourself some high speed footage. Um, the other advantage too is say if you're doing something for social media, as much as I know a lot of people 
hate the idea of shooting things like vertical video for social media. Um, if you need to film something ultra quick and deliver on site to a client, um, that's slow motion, shoot 120 frame in VFR, hold the camera vertical, make sure you're in, uh, um, the MP4 mode, not MOV, make sure you're in MP4. Um, and then you can use the Lumix sync app and send that MP4 120 frame, which would be output in 24 right to your phone to then be able to quickly deliver and actually post. So there's a lot of benefits to using VFR. There's a ton of benefits to using HFR. It just depends on what your workflow is going to be in post. Um, yeah, general comment, doing color grading, shoot HFR, not doing color grading, shoot VFR. Uh, let's see here. Uh, again, thank you, YouTube, for jumping the comments. Uh, Dennis says, says, uh, was the S1H, uh, also had 5.9K 10-bit selected in the codec option. Was wondering if there was any specific 10-bit HDMI output settings. So there is no 10-bit HDMI output settings, but if you're shooting 5.9K 10-bit in camera, it is down sampling, or it's only outputting 4K in ProRes. Um because 5.9K isn't a resolution that goes out there. So you're getting a 4K piece of footage, not 5.9K. As far as it being 10-bit, it should still be coming out as 10-bit. My best guess would be that the video assist might have an issue with it. Um, Cause it's legitimately the first time I've heard someone having an issue with the, the 10-bit ProRes that's being recorded out. Um, but yeah, there isn't going to be a specific 10-bit out in the HDMI options like the older cameras had. Um, but I will do some research on my end to see uh, uh, if I can reproduce what you've got. So, Let's hear. Keith says, is there any way to get full-frame 10-bit 422 Full HD from the S1R? The recording options are MP4 and only 420. Um, so the S1R... Uh, we've talked about this in a number of different areas. The S1R is very much designed with that sensor and the combination of the processor is very much designed as a stills camera. Yes, it can do video. Yes, it has only a 1.01 or 1.09 crop for 4K60. Uh, yes, it has 5K 422 or 420, 10-bit. Um, you have 10-bit 422 over HDMI uh, and I believe that's in 4K. Uh, but... Yeah, basically, if you need recording specs like that, it's an S1, an S1, uh, an S1, S5, or an S1H, um, unfortunately for now. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. William says, does the image processor in the S5 have additional capabilities for possible future firmware updates? I know the GH5 was at its limit, so it didn't get new features. Um... About the most I can say, uh, because it's about the most I know, is that the, the S5 is a much newer camera. Um, it's using a, a much newer processor than what the GH5 was. So, um, you know, kind of bear with it. The S5 is still a relatively new camera, um, relatively. Um, in this world of every six months people want new cameras, um, the S5 is still relatively new. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I... I as far as future firmware updates, I, anything's possible. I just don't know of any specifics. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, Keith says, I meant over HDMI and turtle also super 35, 422. So yeah, unfortunately, Keith with the, the S one R as far as video goes and processing, if you're taking a 47 megapixel sensor and trying to process 10, like 1080p, um, the amount of heat generation with stuff like that, it could be one of the reasons why that camera doesn't do it. Um, I don't know for sure, uh, but I kind of, I kind of don't think because of what that camera is designed for, um, you know, the higher end video stuff is just, it's not what it was designed for. So, um, and it's, we've never positioned it that way either. So, you know, if you really need things like 422 10-bit over HDMI and you really need, you know, all of those recording externally and internally. Um, that's really where you go to an S1, S5, or an S1H. Uh, or the GH line. Let's see here. Um, and to be fair, and to play devil's advocate there, Keith, I I shoot with an S1R primarily, and I like being able to just quickly jump over and do 5K for uh, some video clips and have them in 10-bit. 
Um, so you do have that option. It is HEVC. It is a 420 10-bit file. Um, but 420 10-bit is the one that you would want in HEVC because that's what graphics processors can work with. Uh, 422 10-bit HEVC is a nightmare and you always have to transcode it because there's no GPU acceleration for it. Uh, let's see here. Ruckus says, uh, in... This is a little off topic for frame rates, but um, this question is related to the histogram of the S series. Any chance you may be able to elaborate on what the colors mean of the Lumix histogram and how to tell if it's clipped? Uh, yeah, it's a actually a fairly easy one. Um, when it turns yellow, um, actually, I have to remember this now. Um, histogram. When it turns yellow. Sorry, I just, I have to, I'm turning the histogram on on my uh, S1H here. So, I'll do it like this. So, when it's yellow, uh, that means that you've got some issues with uh, exposure. So, if I do this, start bringing more light into this. And actually, let me bright the, brighten this thing up. Let's go to 100%. So, when I do something like this, you see that it's yellow means that you've got clipping. Um, help if I put the right. Uh, screen up. So right now you'll see that I have yellow on the histogram. That means that there is uh, clipping uh, in, in the image somewhere. Uh, it's the histogram is leaning very heavy to the left, so you know that it's going to be in the shadow region. When I throw a really heavy light on here, you see that it goes up to the highlight region. Um, it's a little more evenly exposed, but you've got clipping in the highlights now. But as I start to back this off, it turns white. That means that you're not clipping anything. Um, that's the basic way to read the histogram on the Lumix cameras. Um, remember, histograms are JPEGs. They're not the raw data. So even if a histogram in pretty much any camera um, says that it's clipped, you may have a little more flexibility in that file for um, highlight and shadow pull. Uh, that's why, like if you're shooting video, you want to use waveform if the camera's got it. It's way more accurate and better. But as far as stills go, you're pretty much using um, the histogram. So, or yeah, the histogram. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Christian says, I really miss 24p on the S1. Uh, the S1 does have 24p. Uh, the S1 is 24p in full for 1080 in uh, AVC HD, uh, but it doesn't have true 24. It doesn't have cinema 24. Um, that's what you got to go to uh, an S1H for. Uh, let's see here. Dan Hopkins. Hi, Dan. 48 frames per second B-RAW and HDMI output would be amazing. Uh, Real-time playback in 24p looks far better than 60p. Uh, better for low light versus 60p and 50% slow-mo in a 24p timeline is perfect. Yes, there are a ton of benefits to doing uh, 48p. The catch is, is that 48 frames per second is not an HDMI standard frame rate. So unless the specification changes and it becomes a frame rate spec, even in RAW, because RAW has RAW is still bound by what the frame rate specifications are over an HDMI cable. Um, probably not going to see it unless the spec changes. Um, but yeah, so that's... I agree with you. I'd love to have it in B-RAW or ProRes RAW, um, or even just out over HDMI. Um, what I do know is that 120 frames per second is a standard. I mean, monitors, the display I'm using right now, actually two of the displays I've got set up right now, uh, our feedback in 120 frames. So that is a spec. Um, but yeah, 48 frame, it's that it's that weird one that works great for editing and capture, but no one uses for display other than uh, I saw someone commented uh, about The Hobbit, uh, which was shot in 48 frame and displayed in 48 frame in some cases. Uh, typically it gets called the soap opera look. So uh, let's see here. Um... <laughs> More of, more of Dan uh, supporting the 48 frame. Yes, I, you know in the conversations, uh, as long as you're the same Dan Hopkins that I've talked to on Facebook, you know that I, I am fully behind the idea of 48 frame. I love, I love having it. I just don't use it um, because I output 60. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jake says, just want some clarification. Focus to infinity and looking at a blank canvas is the best way to see if you need sensor cleaning. Also, hand blowers are okay for sensor cleaning. Um, pretty much, yeah. If you focus to like infinity and you have a white wall, but more importantly, stop the lens down. 
because you don't really care about things like diffraction or sharpness or stuff like that. What you're trying to do is you're trying to focus um, anything that's on the sensor. Um, when you do stuff like that, that's one of the ways that, you know, a lot of times you can check to see if there's dust on the sensor. Um, and you'll know when you've got dust on the sensor when you do something like that because they'll be like blobs uh, and they'll be dark. Um, they may not be fully, you know, kind of, uh, was it opaque? They may still be a little transparent, um, but that's that's how I test to see if I've got some uh, uh, some issues with noise on a sensor. Uh, not noise on a sensor, dust or dirt on a sensor. Um, okay, one of the last things that I wanted to show here was one of the other clips that I've done uh, using VFR. So one of the things that's fun with with VFR shooting, and one one of the reasons why I I think any cam anyone that has a camera that has high speed filming. It's so cool to see things that you normally would just be seeing day to day in slow motion. So this is shot in VFR um, of just some dice being thrown. Um, these are dice that my wife uses for Dungeons and Dragons. And, uh, it, you know, it, you get some cool light set up. You start playing around with it. And it's so much fun to actually just start messing with this and actually displaying it. So the cool thing with this and the reason why I'm showing this clip is that one, it's ridiculously slow. So you've got some really awesome frame rates and detail that you can pull out of an image like this. Um, this is shot in a 709 color profile, so it's pretty much shot so that I can just deliver right away. I didn't want to edit any of this. Um, but what you realize is that that die, that die was only spinning for a couple of seconds versus when you put it into VFR, how much, like how long that die is still just spinning. Uh, for this. Um, it makes for some really cool fun things to shoot. In some cases it can be novelty, uh, but it's always fun to actually play with stuff like this and just find ways that you can work it into your workflow. Um, with our cameras, like I said, the variable frame rate, there's not going to be any autofocus. Um, depending on the camera that you have though, uh, the GH5 Mark II, I believe, you can do push AF before you start recording in VFR. So that means you can use the back button AF, have it acquire focus, and then start rolling. And then after that, it's manual focus. Where um, other cameras, like earlier iterations of the GH line, G line, um, there wouldn't be any uh, autofocus at all. You always had to just go manual. So that's some different options that you've got there. And then... Uh, like I said, there's no audio. So if you wanted to say add an audio track to this of like the die and then slow it down, that's where you'd go in and just do some Foley work and, you know, record an audio clip of die, slow it down to match what you've got on here. And then you've got it. Um, and that's kind of what I did here. So you can hear the audio uh, coming through that I just captured lightly on the in-camera uh, microphones of the match actually lighting. And then when I start doing into one like this with the speed ramp, um, I just slowed the audio down that I, that I had. So I was able to actually kind of add in audio, um, of the match actually igniting and getting that cool sound. Um, and then in some cases you'll see that there is no audio because I didn't put the audio in. So you're able to actually kind of either create it or just work with it. You, you get some really cool effects. This can be cool for situations where maybe you want to be able to do, um, say like post work, you want to add a slow motion piece of footage into a client's piece as B-roll. You're not really gonna have to worry too much about the, the sound in a case like that. Um, so I'm gonna let this clip finish out and let's look and see what other questions we've got here. Uh, oh wow, it's already five after two. Well, here in, in Texas, it's five after two. Um, so we got time for a couple more questions, but everyone seems to be hanging around so we can run for a little bit longer if everyone wants to, uh, you know, kind of hang out. Um, I always like these streams where, you know, we've got such a, such an active crowd here. You know, you guys are awesome. Um, guys and gals are awesome for, for all the comments and questions that, 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 that you guys drop in here. So, uh, really excited that everyone always joins with these things. Um, let's see here. Lumix cameras, is there a universal base frame rate with which you can achieve kind of everything? Cinematic look, slow-mo, etc. Not really. Um, I mean, as software gets better and better, 
you do start, like I said earlier, you do start to get to the point where you can shoot 60p or 120 frames and then use uh, AI with the graphics processors and software to start creating everything else. And who knows, maybe that will be what happens one day. But as of today, there's not really like a base do this and it'll do everything that you need. Um, it is still incredibly important to make sure that you you shoot and 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 create the content knowing what your output is going to be. Um, I said it before, things like training videos or demonstrations, like cooking shows, stuff like that, it doesn't really make sense to shoot it in 24 if you're trying to show detail in the frames. Um, things blur too easy. Sure, it looks aesthetically pleasing in some cases, but in a lot of cases, it may not actually help the story that you're trying to tell. Um, and the story can be how to use a camera, and here's a training video on it, or here's this couple's beautiful wedding, and we want to show this. You would pick different frame rates for, for those different uh, out, outputs. Um, yeah, filmmaking and cinematography, it's not an easy thing. There's not a, there's not a one button will do everything for you. Um, you know, you ask... 10 people what their recommended settings are and you'll get 10 different answers. Um, let's see here. Uh, all right. Uh, ba, 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 ba. A lot of people hoping for 48 frame, really loving 48 frame. Yeah. So cool. Um, Keith, uh, comment. I have an S1, S1H, and S1R, but my client wants as many points of view as possible. Also, I have an M1 Max, so 422 HEVC or H.264 is not an issue. Double check that. I do not think the M1s actually support 422 10-bit HEVC. Um, I, I am happy if I'm proven wrong, but I'm fairly certain the M1 chips don't natively support it um, because there's a reason 422 HEVC is like 10 bit HEVC is still a, a bit of a challenge. So, uh, let's hear Jonathan says, please add global shutters or faster write speeds. Uh, global shutters, a whole different technology. Um, you look at cameras that do have global shutters versus their rolling shutter counterparts. Typically there's a, a noticeable dynamic range drop when you go to a global shutter, unless technology massively changes. Um, yeah, probably not going to see it in cameras anytime soon kind of thing. Um, you still have bars that you have to hit for image quality and targets. Um, but global sensors are really cool. Not not saying that they're bad or anything like that. I mean, you go to some top-tier cinema cameras and they've got them, and it's they, they produce beautiful imagery. Uh, let's see here. Um, exploring Norway, which frame rates are Netflix certified on... Well, the GH6 hasn't even been announced, and I don't know why you'd want to ask about Netflix certification. Uh, on the S1H, which is a Netflix Post Technology Alliance certified camera, uh, you can go to their website and look at the actual shoot guide uh, that was written up that tells you what frame rates, what aspect ratios, what bit rates are on their list of approved um, recording formats and frame rates. So, yeah, go take a look at the... Um, uh, Netflix post technology site. Yeah. Uh, Keith, uh, FC photo for the M one pro and M max have special purpose hardware for encoding decoding. They're not general purpose GPUs, but specialized to that purpose. Okay. So, uh, Keith, uh, I apologize for, for doubting. Um, you know, that's one of the things when you start working in these higher frame rates and you start going into better compressions and stuff like that, you know, some things work great. Some things don't. Um, yeah, uh, the M1, they're cool, and the M1 Pro and Max and all that, whatever they're called these days now, um, it's really cool, and I think eventually we'll have more universal support for things like 422 10-bit HEVC. But the fact is 90% of people that are going to be filming, 420 10-bit is going to be relatively indistinguishable to 422 10-bit um, for the vast majority of what people shoot. Unless you're doing green screen and... You know, you really need to be able to see that level of detail. It's not as big of a thing right now, but uh, let's see here. Uh, I've done a few tests when dealing with video. Uh, if the dice never stops, we are in a dream exploring Norway. Yeah, right? Uh, cool. All right. Well, that looks like we've wrapped up most of the questions here. Um, I want to 
thank all of you for uh, tuning in and asking some awesome questions and taking part in the poll that I got in there. Uh, I'm going to actually end that as of right now. Um, yeah, this stuff is awesome. Um, you know, I, I love doing these streams. It's so much fun to actually be able to have conversations with all of you, even though they're in chat, you know, in text. It's, it's just so much fun to be able to actually communicate and work with all of you to, you know, hopefully answer some questions and share some knowledge and things that we can do with our cameras. Um, wow, my brain just totally froze. Um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Um, as a reminder, Lumix Pro Services, we've got that available for everybody. Um, We've got that available in the U.S. for red and platinum membership. So you've got a couple different levels that you can take a look at. Globally, uh, we have other uh, available options as well. So you can definitely go take a look at lumix-pro.us if you're here in the United States or just check the links down in the description uh, to see what's available in your region. Uh, if you don't already, uh, I would love it if you would go over to the Instagram account for Lumix USA uh, and give us a follow. Link is in the description as well. Um, that helps us out and we can continue the conversations over there. Um, if you want to catch these broadcasts uh, later or go back and take a look at something that we uh, talk about in here and reference it later, uh, we have a link to the playlist down in the chat as well that has every single one of the Lumix Lives that we've done for the last almost three years, save for like the first three because those were on Facebook. Um, but yeah, Otherwise, thank you all so much. We will be back next week. Uh, next week's stream is going to be uh, Full House. Uh, we've got myself, Matt Frazier's coming back. Uh, Photo Joseph is going to uh, drop in, uh, either drop in or give us uh, a pre-recorded thing. We're still working scheduling and stuff like that out. Uh, and Todd White will be joining us as well. And we're going to be talking all about audio uh, and the importance of audio and how to edit audio. Um, so I really hope you all tune in for that next week. Uh, if you haven't already and you liked what you see, uh, saw here on the stream and the interactions you had, uh, drop a like on this video. It helps me out tremendously in being able to continue to do these streams and just bring more content to everybody. Uh, if you know someone who you think might like these videos, share it. Um, the whole normal, uh, you know, I have no pride. It's the whole normal YouTube spiel. Uh, like, you know, hit the bell icon, all that fun stuff, I guess. Um, and yeah, outside of that, I will see everybody next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, right here on Lumix cameras. So thanks everybody. Hope you all have a good rest of your day too. Later. It would help if my, uh, thing actually went to my, uh, outro screen, wouldn't it? That was so anticlimactic. Anyway, goodbye everybody. Mm -hmm.